Hi there, this is Shane Cochran, General Manager of the Open Chain Project. It's great to have you here on our mini summit today. Looking forward to getting quite a few interesting things done. Uh, just for general context, we're going to kick off with a project update. We'll move into a little bit of information about different geographies. And then we'll head into a discussion on the open chain specification. Uh, we had a surprising amount of people register for this particular event. Uh, 656 people expressed interest. Uh, people are joining right now from various places, which is fantastic. Thank you. As we go through, there is a section for Q&A where you can type in questions. I'd encourage you to do so. Uh, this is meant to be a summit where people can learn about open chain or dig deeper into it. So I would value uh, your questions and comments as we go. On the line right now for speakers, we've got myself and we have also Mark Giese, the chair of the open chain specification work team. So on my side, I coordinate the global activities around open chain and on Mark's side, He's the person who brings together all of the activity into the specification, building our standard. Whether you want to talk about the current version of the standard, the version that's going through ISO or future iterations, he's definitely the right person to talk with. General project update time. Okay, so the project has been very busy because our de facto industry standard, which is seeing increased adoption around the world, just by way of example, we had Cisco announce conformance about two weeks ago. This de facto standard is now being made into a formal standard via ISO. So we're going through a type of fast track process. It's called uh, publicly available specification. We're doing this in collaboration with something called the Joint Development Foundation. And in a nutshell, what's happening is there's a process to convert de facto standards into a formal standard in a relatively short time scale. So about nine months instead of 50 or 60. We are doing this right now and the voting process for our standard is underway in ISO. We expect the voting process to have completed on September 22nd. So open chain as the industry standard for open source compliance will graduate the ISO process in Q3. This is exciting because it means that when we're talking with people who are not familiar with open source, they can very easily understand and engage with the project via understanding it as an ISO standard. One example is that people in sales and procurement can easily utilize it in their purchasing decisions and discussions. We're very excited about open chain as an ISO standard. And that's definitely the main thing we've been focusing on this year. Adjacent to doing something like this formal standardization, we have been continuing to grow the open chain community. We now have local work groups meeting in China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, India, and Germany. In July, we'll be launching the open chain UK work group. Each of these work groups provides a local platform and, where appropriate, in the local language to allow people to engage with the project. It's been tremendous for us actually to learn from people in places like China about their market conditions and their requirements. This has really fed into the growth in maturity and adoption of the project in the last year or so. One quick example here is that in April 2019, we released OpenChain 2.0, the current version of the standard. And when we released OpenChain 2.0, it was incorporating a lot of feedback from people who did not speak English natively. So we managed between 1.2 and 2.0 to choose language that was much easier to understand and much easier to translate. And we have directly to thank people in countries like Japan, China, for this support and helping us make the standard better. That equally applies to our work in ISO. People have been providing a lot of feedback, suggestions, and help. When it comes to North America, 
Uh, we have traditionally dealt with North America via pre-existing infrastructure. So, you know, a lot of the people involved in Open Chain are also involved in To Do Group, which has meetings. Uh, we have some great platforms with conferences in the U.S. and very frequently we'd have things like this mini summit uh, as our rolling work group. Probably due to the COVID-19 situation, we will start to introduce a more formalized Open Chain North America with um, online meetings on a regular schedule. Talking of online meetings, first of all, with the Open Chain project, this year we don't expect any physical travel. So everything we're doing is virtual and we've been working on making the project more accessible and useful in that regard. We now hold bi-weekly webinars on the first Monday at 9 a.m., third Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific. And these webinars provide an opportunity to hear from and talk with speakers that we would otherwise meet at conferences around the world. Additional to these ongoing events, we have an automotive work group that holds quarterly meetings. We have a tooling work group that holds bi-weekly meetings. Uh, and we have just recently launched a bi-weekly specification discussion and drafting meeting. So we have a full roster of online activities and everyone who's interested is welcome to join them. Uh, we will encourage that and we'll explain it more later. I'm gonna wrap up the update by saying that the project has got a terrific amount of community activity. Our mailing list has got over 3,700 subscribers. Our international work groups like automotive and tooling automation have well over 100 subscribers. Work groups in areas like Japan, Japan is particularly busy, it has got almost 200 people from about 100 companies engaging on the work group. We keep a regular cadence of meetings. So Japan meets bi-monthly, China quarterly, India quarterly, Germany quarterly, and so on. We have benefited tremendously from people creating reference material uh, and people helping each other on implementing compliance programs. That's one reason we have this mini summit today. We want to continue that atmosphere and that access, that feeling of community around events like this. On the line right this moment, I see we've got 53 people live. Um, so we're, we're seeing a nice group of people here. Um, I'm going to have a quick look at what type of people we've got. Uh, some of the people here today are people well known to the open chain community. I see we have Kato San from Panasonic by way of example. But we have a ton of people on the line as well who are not part of the day-to-day -day open chain community. Okay, so for everyone who's new, uh, please feel free to jump in at any point as we go through the day. We're going to have a Europe update, an Asia update, and then we're going to hand over to Mark for specification. For the Europe update, this is a pre-recorded discussion with Miriam Bellhausen in Germany. She is the chair of our conformance work team. The reason this is pre-recorded is because it's a weird time in Germany. In fact, for all of us not in the United States, I'm in Japan, um, it's a weird time. Here in Japan, we're at 5.30 a.m., our friends in China, 4.30 a.m. Uh, and in Germany, it's evening time, uh, family time. Nevertheless, we have pulled together uh, some of our international group to help brief you on some of the cool things happening. Let's kick off with Miriam Bellhausen. If there are any issues with the audio, uh, just let me know in the Q&A. Oh, hey, I just got a shout out from Marcel. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the efforts, good job. My pleasure. Okay, so Miriam now, uh, and as as the recording with Miriam is playing, you can jump in and ask questions. I'm very help, I'm happy to address those as we go. Is very much based around all market transactions. So we've heard varying stories where some companies are concerned that their budgets might be cut in the future. So they're trying to use the current year budget to get things done as quickly as possible. We've heard other stories that companies are cutting back on activities that are not super mission critical. 
also on, let's say, the legal side, um, they're focused. Oops, a bit of an audio skip there. Let me see if I can fix that for us right now. Hold on. By the way, if anyone is having trouble uh, with the work they're doing on the Q&A and so on, just let us know. We actually have a technician on the line, so he'll be able to help out. One second, I'll just get this audio fixed. Alrighty, sorry for that. I'm about to replay that audio. So we're going to be hearing from Miriam about the German situation. And I was just wondering, in Germany, have companies changed their behavior a lot? Are they reducing investment in kind of nice to have improvements? Or are German companies that you're aware of basically continuing as normal, continuing to invest in improving processes? continuing to invest in teams in areas that aren't mission critical, but might be strategically useful? Um, so I think I would really differentiate there. Um, up until, let's say, end of May, I would have said they are cutting back on everything that's not necessary. And there's a lot of work that apparently you know, had to get done um, or whether, you know, that they had budget for. So that needed to get done immediately, and it got pushed um, out quicker than it would have, you know, would have been pushed out otherwise. Um, since you know, like May, beginning of June, it feels like that's changed a bit. And um, certainly, there are different, you know, parts of the economy where they are still holding back quite a bit. But it feels like it's also getting back to normal in that area um, where companies are still prioritizing things that really need to get done right now, of course, but they are also, again, starting to focus again on, on policy aspects that, you know, maybe are not mission critical right now. They are nice to have, but they are still kind of trying to put that back in focus and trying to find a solution how to proceed with that, maybe not right now, but down the, down the line. Um, maybe fall after the summer break, um, maybe even late fall, considering you know that maybe we might be heading into like a second wave in, in fall. So yeah, that's that's what I would say is currently the status. That's that's a pretty pretty interesting observation. I mean, I guess it indicates that if there was a, a change from crisis mode back into let's say standard investment mode in May. Uh, that indicated quite a lot of confidence that the companies felt the German economy, the German social situation was probably getting under control. I mean, things weren't back to normal, but there was a path to control the virus. Um, yes, I would agree with that. And if you look at kind of the numbers, um, infections that we had, and also deaths and additional you know, new infections every day, how the testing developed, that kind of falls within that time frame as well. So that was when most of the schools at least partially reopened. That was when um, stores partially reopened, restaurants partially reopened. Um, and of course, it's been increasing ever since. But at least currently, most of the restrictions that were in place have been lifted. And they have been lifted over the last let's say four to six weeks, right? So that kind of falls within the same area. Companies are going back um, to normal office work or at least partially normal office work. And I think that has a lot to do with it. And um, I think that's another factor that we shouldn't dismiss too easily. This whole work from home, kids at home, everyone's at home all the time. 
that of course has an impact on the type of work that you give out, right? You need to, you probably can't get as much work done at home with everyone else around you. So you need to prioritize even there. So even if there isn't a company strategy, you really need to, to find out what you can get done with the limited amount of time that you have available, right? Um, and I would feel that that's also a large factor why certain types of work get, get pushed and other types of work are kind of on hold. It's not because there's necessarily a company policy behind it, but also because people just can't deal with that right now. So That's an interesting point, uh, because there were, there were lost periods around the world. And to be frank, Asia and Germany seem to be roughly in sync with China ahead of us all by a couple of months. Uh, Japan is slightly ahead of Germany in terms of the open up. But the, the time scales are roughly the same. However, during the crisis period, let's say in January to March in China, everything shut. Uh, in kind of mid February until late April, Japan was very much getting a handle on how we do this work from home, when can we expect so. So there, there were lost months where productivity wasn't shut down. It's just that people had to work out, had to change how they did business. They didn't really have so much time for community outreach. Uh, but that seems to be changing. I mean, just last week, we had China, Japan, and Korea virtual meetings for open chain. We had a lot of attendees. Uh, Japan was exceptional. We had 66 people on the line, which was bigger than our normal global meetings. Um, and you know, this week, I wasn't sure if it would work or not, if everyone in Germany was ready to do more community outreach, but the uh, German meeting that we're having this week, the um, week of the um, 22nd of June, just because this is a recording, uh, a lot of people have said they're coming. A lot of people are dialing in. So it seems like people are getting a handle on working from home and now they're contributing to the community again. Um, yeah. I would agree with that. Do you think that we can expect open source communities in particular uh, to continue to function effectively? Or are there perhaps some measures we need to do, something we need to do to help bring momentum back, keep momentum? So in Germany in particular, um, do we need to have some kind of activity, let's say, ensuring that the events have specific international knowledge, or can we have events which are much more about interpersonal sharing? Um, so do we need to change course from basically interpersonal sharing into trying to deliver more outside business knowledge to ensure people can allocate time, or will people be able to allocate time as normal? Um, so I would say open, or, sorry, let me start that again. Um, I would say that the pandemic is going to be a boost for open source and sharing and just in general looking at technology. Um, and if you look at what companies are doing, it feels like over the last couple of months, a lot more companies have been open sourcing their products. And if you look at this entire discussion around the, the contact tracing apps. For Germany, there was a big topic. Everything was open source. It was all over the news. And I think it, you know, kind of got to the attention of even more people, you know, who were, who you were able to reach with Paul. Um, and with companies like in, in Germany, SAP and uh, Deutsche Telekom developed this app. Um, they are well known companies and Probably people wouldn't have put them in context with open source and now everyone's realizing, well, they are actually really active in this area. And I think that's going to be a big boost for, for companies dealing with open source, looking at open source, or trying to find solutions like OpenChain is doing, right? Um, I think availability of information is going to be key because, you know, it, it's just coming up in conversations much more naturally than before. So people are going to be looking for information on everything and entirely different topics, right? And how do I open source? How do I set up a compliance program? Um, how do I ensure compliance? Um, just all of these topics, right? They are just going to be coming up and, and 
companies will want information on that. So I don't think that there needs to be a specific focus. It just needs to be made sure that people have access to information if they are looking for it and that they can get it whenever they, they want to get it. So that would be what I'm, what I'm seeing right now um, as in black companies doing in the open source sector, right? Yeah. Um, I would feel that that if companies are focusing more on open source, there's going to be at least some more or less natural boost for the community as well. Um, but of course, the community that doesn't have corporate backing um, as much as may, may be necessary in some occasions, there may be bigger issues due to the pandemic, just you know, just because of cutbacks and, and things like that. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I, I guess uh, when it comes to, let's say, uh, vendor activities, so we have various companies uh, like consultancies, law firms, uh, certifiers in Germany. Um, strategically speaking, there was a little bit of a concern that their business might get hit by economic cutbacks. And certainly, that still appears to be potentially true in the United States for the pandemic is not under control by any measure. Uh, but it seems in Japan, for example, that companies will be working with their vendors pretty much as normal. And it sounds like Germany might be the same in this post-May period. Yes. Yes, I would agree. Um, as, as I said, I think there may be sectors where that's totally different and where um, actors would entirely disagree with me. But on the, like, for the most part and overall, I think, yes, um, companies are working with their vendors as normal. Um, business is kind of picking up again. Um, also, supply chains are still disrupted, but it seems like they are not disrupted that much anymore. So, yeah, I, I think it's getting back to normal. And I think one factor that you know, again, with regard to open source that we should keep in mind for, for Germany and maybe even for all of Europe is that there's a, a very big push from public authorities, um, public offices, uh, cities, you name it, to move towards open source, to move towards open data. There's EU initiatives actually pushing and requesting open data initiatives. And I think that's going to be, again, an, another big move for all of these open source, open data players, um, where that is still moving further into the discussion and, and you know, still becoming a bigger topic across Europe. For the next couple of months, um, especially with like the new legislation coming into force in, or necessarily becoming into force in all member states like mid next year. So I think that that again going to be a big push at least in this public sector, um, and that always triggers through through to everyone else, right? If they are requesting open, then you need to provide open at some point. And I mean, a, a somewhat related question to this, and we're moving away from, let's say, the open source community or the change into the more general copyright. We've, of course, famously had uh, Patrick McCarty as a copyright following in Germany. Uh, but his, his mode of operation seems to have adjusted a bit. He's, uh, he's not doing the situation where we go to a company with one piece of incompliant firmware and then sign a contract and then scan all of their bank catalog and come back with hundreds of potential compliance violations. Instead, it appears he's approaching companies with um, a potential violation and essentially charging engineering hours. Um, the interesting thing with McCarty is that the perceived threat of McCarty himself or copyright uh, trolls who copy him appears to be dropping. Um, that's the perception we have in many geographies um, because we haven't seen the emergence of copycats, we haven't seen McCartney's uh, activities growing, we've seen them decreasing and more effective defense against them. Uh, I was just wondering, this because actually McCartney operates in Germany, is, is your perception that that aspect of risk vector and open source, while not gone, appears to be more contextualized, more controlled at this juncture? Or do you think it's still a very touchy subject and that 
German area for German companies? I think it depends, again, on the type of company that you're talking to. Um, I feel the same for both international players or you know, companies that have been targeted by McCarty at some point in the past. Um, if you look at the number of enforcement that's still going on, um, it feels like he's still very active. Um, but the target seems to have shifted a little bit to maybe not the, the large multinational companies, but rather, you know, something that's more local, um, companies that may not have their compliance in place and compliance policy strategies in place. So, um, I can understand that internationally, people are feeling this is becoming less relevant. For Germany, I don't think it is. Um, but the target obviously shifted, right? Um, and what I, what I heard as well, um, and I found this to be really interesting, is that he's actually reaching out to companies that have been in compliance for several years, um, essentially just sending them a letter saying, okay, we're actually, you know, we're, we're declaring the agreement that we signed with you five, ten, I don't know, years ago um, to be invalid now because we don't want to rely on these claims anymore so you can destroy it. Um, which is, it seems to be an interesting step, let's say, um, but he, he has been doing that for a little while now. It's always good to get some information around him because I suppose McCarty symbolizes the greatest nervousness that people had around open source. You know, whether it was patents or copyright, that someone would have a successful attack vector and could leverage it. And he sort of embodies one of these successful attack vectors and people like to track how it's evolving. So I really appreciated your insight there. Um, the last item I'd like to cover uh, would essentially be open chain is set to be an ISO standard. Uh, according to the ISO database, September 22nd. Uh, we have a lot of support from companies. Uh, at the time of this recording, uh, we haven't announced it yet, so I can't say who it is, but a, a major German automotive company just joined the Open Chain Board. And this type of investment, this activity is, is really growing. Um, now that we're about to be an ISO standard, we're about to go deeply into procurement and sales, outside of the open source offices, outside of the open source strategy people, more generally across corporate procurement. Do you have any suggestions for what we can do in Germany to make sure that companies feel comfortable and find it easy to adopt open chain, uh, particularly something that we might not be doing today? And I say this because the open chain community, while not super insular, it's a few hundred companies with people who know open source very well. But of course, in a few months, our audience will be thousands of companies, many of whom use open source, but aren't really part of the community and they don't necessarily have that background. And there might be a, a bridge we need to build to ensure they can engage effectively or they don't get confused. And I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Um, yes, I think one of the key factors is going to be that companies, people in general, feel they can safely ask questions without being laughed at or, you know, made fun of or, you know, people thinking, oh, oh my God, what are they doing? Um, and I think to communicate, you know, this is not, we're not blaming anyone if you don't have this in place. This is not something that you should have had for years or that is so well established that, you know, it's, it's really bad if you don't have it. That is going to be a key factor where you know people know okay this is someone i can reach out to they are not going to communicate this openly um, it's not going to be known to all my competitors that maybe i didn't have this before um, i think that's going to be an important factor i think we already do that um, in open chain and i think that is very well known with everyone who's already engaged but if you're just adding out in that area you may not feel like that is actually happening and people are going to keep things let's say Excellent. secret or at least not blame them for it so yeah that would be something i focus on. i focus on it you know i want to make decisions hypothetically speaking then and this was something that bounced around a few times but we never uh, 
explicitly launched it, perhaps the OpenChamp project explicitly on the front page should make it clear that you know you could book a one-to-one -one call in private with, for instance, the general manager uh, to talk through some of these items if you wish, um, as as a bridging system to bring people in. And then, of course, companies, if they want specific help and support, then there's a very large partner ecosystem that they can get commercial services off, and there's a very large community ecosystem yeah. where they can talk to their peers. Yeah, yeah I think that, that may actually make sense um, to have something on there. If that's going to be published on the website, I would also make clear this is just a talk through, this is just for you to ask questions. So you don't have to reach out to like a mailing list where you don't know who's on there, who will be responding. Um, you know exactly who you'll be talking to. You can pick who you want to talk to. Um, and maybe just reach out also in a language that you feel comfortable with, right? Um, things like that. So I, yeah, I, I would make that really clear as well, that this is something that is open and welcoming for everyone. So they feel comfortable reaching out. Absolutely. Um, that's a, a very good point. And we have to, of course, have a clear distinction between helping people understand the thing and actually explicitly endorsing a particular solution as the solution. And I, I just mentioned that because sometimes companies approach me directly, which is great, um, but they ask me questions like, uh, what is the correct training for open chain? And the answer <laughs> is, it depends. <laughs> it depends what you are. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's a very lawyerly response. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, thing is, yeah. the last thing we want to do is frighten away companies by overloading them with you know, inappropriately complex mechanisms when they might need something very simple. And at the same time, we don't want to tell companies to do something very simple when they might need something more robust. So it's really a case of let's contextualize your workload and, and see. Yeah. That's yes, and and that's something that you know, especially when you're just starting out, or you know, maybe you've already used open source for quite a long time, but now you want to professionalize it a bit more. Um, where where it needs to be clear to everyone that this is something that everyone has down from the beginning, um, and you're the only one who has an issue with that. It's a it's really a question of finding something that works for you, works for your business model, works for the type of software that you're using, or the, even the types of licenses that are relevant in your context, right? Um, all of this, I think that's something that needs to be really clear for, for people starting out um, and, and coming into contact with this for the first time. So, yeah. Yes, no, that's, that's a really good point. Um, and I suppose the last item would be how do you personally manage it? Because you have on your hat uh, the community hat of conformance and open chain. You've guided that from zero into a proper structured conformance approach and went to things like our self certification. Um, and you also have a separate hat as uh, a lawyer. Um, and I was wondering, in the community sense, how do you manage to deal with the two hats? Did you ever find situations where you know you had this? swap someone over from, oh, what you're talking about today isn't community conformance, but you're talking about a specific company activity and that belongs more in a, you know, a privileged conversation and so on. Did you ever find that balance difficult or has it just been something that works naturally in the way you approach the community anyway? Um, I think as a lawyer, you always have to kind of balance that because you need to have to, to really be able to advise on certain topics, you need to have that contact to the community, the sector, whatever you, you're working with. Um, so I think that kind of a balance everyone needs to strike if you're working as a lawyer. Um, I personally would always say, you know, especially when I'm talking to clients and I'm talking at events, I would always say, okay, this is something that I'm talking about as open chain work chair, work team chair. Now, this is something that I know from experience because I've been working as a lawyer, for example, advising on compliance projects, for example, um, involved in enforcement cases or something like that. So I would always try and make clear what the role is that I'm taking on at the time. And it may also be that, you know, even in, within a conversation that I'm saying, okay, this is 
now, now I'm switching from this position to this position, um, and that's why I know something about this, or that's why you know I, I want to talk to you about that. And of course, everything that needs to be handled in like a, a, a client attorney setting, um, I would obviously not talk about at discussions in the community. Maybe try and bring knowledge to the to the table that you know because certain or that you have because certain companies or to, certain types of companies have been dealing with the same questions. Um, but then of course generalize it so that it becomes something that you know may be recognized by others as well as an issue that they've been dealing with. That's a great point. I suppose this underlines once again the fact that in an open source community like this people can engage effectively with multiple hats and hesitations people have in stepping forward are understandable but in practice we manage it effectively and we don't have issues around contribution while also being a professional in the field and i just bring that up because companies new to this area might find it a little alien to see that happening yeah, but I mean, no one's forced to actually engage, right? You, you're welcome to just listen in, at least for the time being, and find out how others are doing it. It's not like you need to contribute from day one. So I think, you know, you can learn to strike that balance and to find a way that works for you in your specific setting, um, which may include that you're, you're not ever contributing because it doesn't work, but you can still learn from what everyone else is doing and maybe in private conversations have a discussion about what might be possible, let's say, for example, in, in the defense sector, yeah, where you certainly have higher um, confidentiality obligations than in other sectors. So um, I think that's an option as well. Absolutely. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I guess at, at that point, um, I would just note that the open chain main mailing list is certainly embodies that. Uh, the last time I checked, incredibly, we've got more than 3,700 subscribers, which is a lot. And of course, the active community yeah. is smaller. So it's clear many people are listening and waiting to see how things evolve. Uh, so, yeah. Miriam, your time today. It's been fantastic to be able to run through these items with you, and I think it will be really valuable uh, to people around the world in our community. Well, thank you for chatting. So there we have it, um, a little bit of a, a chat with Miriam to get the European perspective on how open chain is being perceived. One of the main takeaways, I think, from Miriam is that Germany's pretty much back to business as normal, perhaps with a slightly larger buy-in to open source predicted. Naturally, not exactly business as normal. Companies like Daimler, companies like BMW are going to sell significantly less product, but the shutdown situation is not preventing since May engagement uh, that is useful for communities like ours. And as we mentioned in the talk, we just had a meeting in Germany, which was nicely attended, and we had some really great feedback about things like local translations of information. In Asia, and that's the next section for us, the Asia update, uh, it's very similar. Uh, I think it was just last week or the week before, we had three meetings, one China, one Japan, one Korea. All of the meetings were well attended. Some of them, like in China, we had a little bit of an international focus. We went over things like the McCarty issue. Uh, some of them, like in Japan, there was a, a great deal of discussion about sub-work groups and so on doing work locally. And uh, in Korea, there was a lot of note sharing between companies. I think we had uh, Kakuo talking about how they are working in open source. It's a messenger platform in Korea. On the line today, we actually have a bunch of our Japanese um, community members. So just by way of example, uh, I just had a question from Kubota-san, if there will be a recording of this made available. Uh, yes, I'm recording this and I will be making the audio available. Uh, we have people like Osaki-san from Fujitsu and Joji san from Toshiba. These are board members of the OpenChain project. 
Catasan from Panasonic as well. So we have some great people on the line if you have specific questions for Asia. But the overarching story here is that in Asia, in Japan, we have a mixture of room, remote and local working. Um, in China, people are pretty much back at the office. In Korea, it's, it's still a lot of remote work, um, but people are working away as usual. And of course, in some geographies like uh, on the uh, situation with Taiwan is that they never really had a problem with COVID and they're back to work. So for us in Asia, it's pretty clear that things are functioning all right. One thing that's worth noting about Asia is that some of the companies in places like China have been increasingly involved in international open source. So a good example is that Oppo, the company that makes a lot of cell phones, for instance, it recently sold its 180th million cell phone in India, uh, they joined the open chain board. Uh, so they are standing alongside their peers from companies like Japan and so on uh, with a very strong international focus. And that's notable because for a long time we were looking at kind of open source going into places like China. Now what we're seeing is that the massive companies with huge investment in open source from China are going to take global leadership roles. Uh, actually, we just had a meeting yesterday with uh, our partner review and membership review subcommittees for the governing board. And the people sitting on the committee, we had Dave Marr, our chairman from Qualcomm. Uh, we had Chris Fan from OPPO. And we had SC Lin from Moxa, a Taiwanese uh, IoT company. I think they're number three in the world for smart connection devices. So, you know, very international flavor on our project. And a lot of our Asian contributors are very active in building material and community that affects the global side. One thing I'd like to do here um, is actually bring in one or two of the Asian community members. Um, so, Kubota-san, if it's okay for you to type in the question area, um, I'm just checking our, what, what subgroup are you in in the Japanese um, open chain community? Because we have, this is for the audience, in Japan, it's amazing how many uh, work teams we have. We've got subgroups for licensing, FAQ, planning. Uh, these subgroups are all working on materials and solutions for their geography. And of course, internationally. Uh, Japan has a supplier education leaflet. And the supplier education leaflet was created simultaneously in Japanese and English. Uh, it has subsequently been translated into Korean, simplified Chinese, traditional Chinese, and it's gone around the world. Uh, it's been remarkable how that information has passed through. No typing from Kapoda's then at the moment. <laughs> um, okay, so what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna move us on after saying we're doing a lot in Asia and you can track it on the website, I'm gonna move us towards the spec, which is the real meat of what we're doing here. The open chain specification is in the ISO fast track process and brace yourself, this is a, a wordy sentence because it's the formal description. Uh, the open chain submission is via the I, ISO IEC JTC1 pass trans, uh, transposition process to result in an international standard. The process usually takes 7 to 11 months. Our ISO IEC JTC1 submission is in the ISO database. The DIS ballot, which is DIS 5230, launched on June 30th and concludes September 22nd. Uh, before that, there was an eight-week period for national standard bodies to translate the submission. The pending on the DIS ballot result and comments received, there may need to be uh, a further FDIS um, ballot, which could take eight weeks, or that will be skipped and will just be an international standard. The actual international standard will be published within six weeks of the DIS ballot if there are no further comments or requirements. Um, and that has been done with great help from some of our friends in the Open Chain board. Osaka-san from Fujitsu, for example, has been super helpful here. David Rudin at Microsoft, fantastic. 
Seth Newbury over at the Joint Development Foundation, and our past mentor, Brian McAuliffe. Long story short, OpenChain 2.0 becoming an ISO standard, functionally identical OpenChain 2.0 and the ISO standard. We're going to be hosting the ISO formatted standard on our website. It'll be freely available. We're going to label it OpenChain 2.1 because its formatting has changed, but none of the requirements have changed. That said, you know, this is an open project. We never stay still. And with OpenChain, one of the important things for us has been how do we capture the feedback? I mean, as we go out there in ISO, as thousands or tens of thousands of companies work with OpenChain, we're going to be getting feedback from a lot of people uh, about the standard. And we want to make sure that from day one, we can capture that effectively. We don't plan to replace or update our ISO standard at any high speed because it takes a long time to deploy standards and procurement. We know that. We do plan to start taking notes right now. And in fact, uh, last month, we launched that process in June. So we're having bi-weekly specification meetings chaired by Mark DC uh, to take on board suggestions, comments about the current open chain standard and what can happen in the future. Some of these comments and suggestions will be resolved by making reference material, clarification material as needed. Some of these comments and suggestions will be incorporated in future drafts of the standard. What I'd like to do is to hand over to Mark now um, to let him talk through a bit about how that process goes. You know, this is separate from our ISO standard publication. This is about how we capture the feedback and how that feedback informs the future. And it's a very important process because this is a genuine community um, project. It means everyone's voice is heard and everyone's opinion is counted. So I'm going to hand over to Mark, uh, if that's okay. Let's see if the transition works well. Hi. Hey, Sean, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, All right. I got a message, it sounds great. So one of the interesting things to understand is that um, OpenChain is an open source project and it's based on contributions from over 200 professionals. And so that the, this spec is not just um, a small group of people, but it's been through the eyes of many and the feedback has been incorporated. And what it represents, the spec really represents is a set of requirements that every high quality um, compliance program uh, should, um, the, should meet. So if you're, for example, a supply, uh, you're a supplier and you wanna convey that to your customers, then obtaining open chain conformance is a great way to communicate that. If you're an internal legal department and you want to get more comfort in how your company's handling open source, then obtaining open chain conformance is really helpful to giving that comfort, that assurance. So I think that um, if you're a actual um, company that receives in software from a supplier, then this is an opportunity to ask them, your, your, your suppliers, whether they're open chain conforming or not. Now, it, it sounds like a big burden sometimes to say, oh, you must be. You don't have to require them to be 100%. What you can do to help them along is to suggest that they come forward um, with just the requirements they can satisfy and show you some evidence of that. In fact, at our company at Wind River, we're audited uh, several times a year from very big um, vendors. And oftentimes in those audits, they're coming in to review our open source, I'm sorry, our engineering software, engineering processes. And one of the standard questions that exists is, how do you handle open source? And what I always start that conversation out with saying, since we're open chain conforming, I say, here's the specification. We're satisfying all these requirements and we can show you evidence for each of those requirements. And it turns that conversation to what could be an hour or two into less than a half hour sometimes because it's very well laid out. And by talking to the spec, um, it gives people 
a, um, a contract of how that dialogue should go. And it allows that conversation to happen very quickly. So there are many benefits, as I just highlighted. There could be, you could be a supplier. You want to represent your discipline around open source, or you want your suppliers to show you they're disciplined, um, then you can ask for it. Or you could be an internal, you know, legal group possibly, or a group that's concerned about discipline around open source. So um, I think that's always helpful to highlight. I don't know if it's possible for me to uh, share my screen. I can pop a few slides up. If if anybody is new, I have a uh, a few slides that will tell the story about open chain in under four minutes. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, let me split this down. Uh, can you see my screen? Let's see. Yeah. Actually, hold on a second here. Um, okay, so. The one thing to know, um, one of the things I like to highlight is Open Chain is about a program. It's about the conformance um, to a set of requirements for a given program. And what happens is in comes a, you know, a set of software that's being used, um, and you want to disclose all the open source within that software. And then what happens is as part of the process, a bill of materials is um, created, which then um, is input into the whole clearance process. And then the output of that compliance program is obviously some software, but also a collection of compliance artifacts, including the source code, legal notices, and the SPX data, and possibly the bill of materials itself. Some customers would like to receive that as well. What OpenChain um, says is that I can trust that program. And not only can I trust that you have a disciplined program, but that I can trust those artifacts that you're giving me that they've been prepared with discipline, okay? Um, I always like to highlight, you know, when I think about the open chain spec, I think about six core pillars that it represents. It ensures that every company that is open chain conforming has a policy in place and that that policy is communicated effectively, that you have training and all the key people have been properly trained, that you have all the required roles and responsibilities properly assigned and resourced, and that also um, as part of that process, you are able to create a bill of materials um, along the way. And that's really important because without that, um, you don't know really what's in the code. And with it, it could be very, very useful for many activities, not just open source compliance, but also security or export. And then also uh, the spec then has a set of um, requirements around ensuring that you prepare the proper compliance artifacts. And then um, that if you have a, uh, an opportunity to contribute back to the community that you have a proper policy in place. And in a nutshell, if you didn't know what open chain was, this is one of the best ways to think about it in the most simplest sense. Okay. And by the way, when I get audited from a outside vendor, I always put up these slides um, to articulate that. So if you ever looked inside the spec, we're not going to go through the spec in great detail, but the one thing to understand about the spec is that if you ever looked at it, it's pretty straightforward and simple in its language. And it's not a ton of pages uh, um, to, to wane through. It's really 12 pages with a lot of white space. But the key point here is each of those pillars we talked about, you have a simple um, requirement and then some course, um, what we call verification artifacts that you have to satisfy. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, in order to make sure that you have the policy requirements satisfied, you, it's documented and it's properly communicated. Um, just to give you another example of another pillar we just talked about. There's one about the bill of materials It'll make a simple statement about what you need to do with respect to the bill of materials and have a very explicit set of requirements here. It has two requirements that state that you must, you know, have a documented procedure that shows that you're identified tracking, reviewing, and, and clearing and archiving the stuff. Again, I'm just trying to give you a sense of what it is if you're not familiar with it. Um, and uh, if you are, then this is going to be over very soon. And then finally, the other pillar, we, you know, we talked about, you have the compliance artifacts. It talks about having a process in place. Um, and then again, you have two requirements to satisfy. Actually, what I want to do is change to another slide deck and talk about the spec, and then we'll open it up to questions. <clears throat> we just launched um, the spec, uh, the 3.0 initiative. But um, as Shane pointed out, we're in the process of um, waiting to hear back from the ISO um, 
organization to um, let us know that we've been accepted. And if um, if you ever wanted to participate or join this uh, activity, the specification, you're always welcome. Everybody's welcome. It's an open source project. Um, and what we do provide is a, <clears throat> a wiki page that I just wanted to highlight that exists. And if you go there, you can see um, all the previous versions of the spec, the current spec, and also the process we follow. I won't go through it in, in any detail, but you can read that if you want to understand how we work. One of the most important things I encourage anybody who wants to contribute to the open chain um, spec is that we have a, a frequently asked questions. <clears throat> I highly encourage you to read those before contributing to understand kind of the philosophy behind that. Okay. Um, one of the key things in our, in our efforts to, um, to produce the spec is we follow some key principles. Um, first of all, uh, one of the most important um, principles is that we want to ensure that we're building trust around the use of open source. Um, the second principle is that we want to make sure that we're focusing on the what and why. In other words, we're not too prescriptive. We're simply stating some high-level requirements that we believe every high-quality compliance program should have. Um, we're not dictating to you how to do it. There are many ways to do it. We allow everybody to have a lot of flexibility on implementing it, but it ensures that certain things are in place, as we saw by looking at the spec. The other important guiding principles, number three, is less is more. We're very focused on making sure that we keep it very focused, and very tight to the um, quality of a compliance program and <clears throat> and the fact that um, there's um, it's, it's very easy to get through the spec without having to wade through a lot of um, confusing um, text. And finally, as it's been highlighted a little earlier, we do function as an open initiative. We are also a standard, but we're open to everybody to participate. And as I noted earlier, we've had over 200 people provide feedback on the current version that we have out today. As we embark on the 3.0 um, drafting, these are the um, objectives that we set out. So if you see something that you relate to and you think you can contribute, um, to the spec and you haven't, this is something to keep in mind. Um, first of all, um, we're really focused on obtaining feedback from people who are ready, um, from those who are trying to um, uh, incorporate the spec um, into their organization, okay? Now, some people have implemented it successfully. Some people, um, some organizations are struggling um, and we're trying to always understand what the, what the obstacles are. Um, the third um, objective is really about um, ensuring that we continuously stick to maintaining a very minimum set of requirements. We don't want to get too bloated. And that we're focused on what we expect every single program, every compliance program to have in terms of quality. The fourth um, objective is, is kind of new and interesting. Um, we're actually doing an exploratory um, investigation on how the spec might grow to have a wider scope in terms of um, it's still about helping people trust open source software, but it's more about, um, you know, can we trust it not only with respect to license, license compliance, but possibly also security vulnerabilities. Now, this is not necessarily something we required of every person as a compliance program, but it would be an optional piece. And we're really not... Um, trying to necessarily put that into the 3.0 spec, but more explore this option as an add-on or, you know, to the actual spec and not a, a mandatory requirement of the spec. And we'll probably look at the output of that process or that exercise and decide maybe in the future versions whether we should consider security vulnerabilities with respect to trusting open source. And um, so that that that's that. And then finally... Um, I want to highlight to everybody here that um, we have a number of resources that are helpful. I've mentioned them, some of them along the way. Um, one of the ones I haven't talked about already, um, already is the issues list. So if you find that you've read the spec and you're having issues with the spec or have recommendations on how to improve the spec, we have a place on GitHub where you can list out your issue. Uh, with respect to um, uh, uh, 
how you might want to see this these spec evolve. I'm not going to go through these discussions. That, that's all I have for for the spec. I want to open it up more to questions. Um, let me stop sharing. Okay. So, uh, any questions or? Oh, I see. I see something here. Uh, Song Lee has just typed, what's the prospective group of people who will benefit from OpenChain project? What type of revenue may be generated for OpenChain? Um, the, I'm, I'm guessing perspective is prospective group. Uh, I would say that the people who will benefit from OpenChain, it's any organization dealing with open source. Fundamentally, open source is third-party intellectual property, and it's licensed conditional on some various things. So you can only gain access to and use this third-party IP if you obey the licenses. It's that simple. And if organizations uh, have issues with licensing, they stand several risks. One is that they can no longer use the code. The other is that they are infringing someone's copyright and can face legal action. And of course, there's the issue that because this is third party IP where people are sharing their work, if there's an actor who isn't respecting it, who isn't playing fair, you're not going to get the same benefits of collaboration. So long story short, anyone who's using open source needs to follow the licenses. And if someone wants the easiest way to follow the licenses, open chain as a clear standard is the easiest way to get that process in place. So any organization using open source can use open chain to one, make things a lot simpler, and two, make sure that they are uh, sharing from the knowledge benefits of everyone else using the standard. So it's very similar to if you look at something like ISO 9001, a quality standard. The reason everyone uses that is because we all know that there's a baseline of quality. With open chain, the reason people use that is because we know there's a baseline of compliance approach. So as Mark said, the key requirements of a quality open source uh, program. The second question, what revenue might be generated? Um, I, Mark, I don't know what, how, how you frame that. I'd say, um, if you're talking about organization revenue, um, I'd say you, you do not gain revenue from using a standard like OpenChain. What you do is you dramatically reduce risk and therefore you save resource costs. Do you think that would be a good way to put it, Mark? Yeah, I actually view it also as um, you may um, prevent yourself from losing revenue. And what I mean by that is um, when you deal with your customers and you enter into contracts, so Wind River is like in the middle of the supply chain with respect to um, delivering software. And oftentimes our software serves as like a, the nervous system of our customers' devices. For example, we offer up a commercial grade Linux. Now, we enter into a lot of contracts and I can tell you that there are certain contracts we're just not gonna sign if we don't have a certain kind of discipline around open source. And so I find this actually helps revenue generation in that sense, meaning it gives our biggest customers, our largest customers, that comfort when we're engaging with them um, and so I think it's necessary in order to articulate that. And I only see this growing, the, 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 the requests around not just open source, you know, um, compliance, but what's grown in the last two years, and particularly in the last six months I've seen, is the request for a bill of materials, of an open source bill of materials. Right. And if your organization cannot deliver that, and there's for two reasons, right, compliance, and the second reason is for security around open source. People want to know that you can m manage that. And if you cannot demonstrate that or deliver that, then you're not going to be able to sign that contract. So, um, and then finally, I think just from, a, as Shane points out, liability within your own organization, if, if you mess up and somehow you get into a certain situation where you're not properly handling the open source, I've seen one case where a company was trying to get acquired um, and they really botched up the management around open source and the acquisition deal um, didn't go away completely, but a major haircut on the valuation uh, took place. So I think if you're a company and you just want to make sure you're, you're highly, you know, you're doing the role, the right things, um, 
then I think that, um, especially, you know, if your company could be sold, I think you want to get comfort internally, then I think having open chain conformance um, give that, that comfort is, is critical. That's actually such a good point. Um, it, it reminds me a little bit of how open chain is already used in M&A. Uh, it's in active discussions with m a Let me see if I can share my screen very briefly. Uh, I don't have a share button here. Uh, okay. All right. Um, so we actually have a whole book about open chain in m a on our website. So it's utilized there in m a discussions. I mean, long story short, if people are going to use open source, we have to know that they're compliant. And open chain is the distillation of a huge amount of knowledge of how to be running a compliance program that works. So anyone using that is uh, essentially doing the right stuff. And we do see a lot of increased adoption. So we see a, a lot of uh, people working with open chain. We see it going into areas like procurement. As Mark said, you can expect a lot of people to be asking for open chain conformance so they know that your company meets the minimum requirements of a quality program for conformance. Uh, we have a great question in from Marcel. Uh, he says, should we communicate quite clearly that 3.0 will only be coming out in a few years? Otherwise, adoption of the existing ISO standard might be affected. Um, I, I, would, I would answer, yeah, I mean, the, the ISO standard is not intended to iterate quickly. So people should message that the ISO standard is it. Uh, we spent years making it. It's ready to go. And it's not going to be something that we iterate quickly. When it comes to our automotive members, uh, we're looking at a situation where it's literally going to take years for it to go through their procurement process with hundreds of companies. So we don't want to have confusion there. Um, but at the same time, we want to make sure there's an avenue for capturing information and future drafting from day one. So we want to make sure that that process is there. Uh, Mark, does that capture it adequately in your perspective? Yes. I think it's important for us not to be too dramatic in our changes, right? For that very reason that's been, you know, pointed out and that we don't anticipate um, a, a, a rapid, a big change at all, but more about probably 3.0, you know, will come out in a much longer time frame than we would normally expect. And there'll be ample time for people to uh, to migrate to that new version, but also we'd be very mindful of that new version and, and, and the ability to migrate to it. So, yeah. I mean, hypothetically, I'm just typing this into the Q&A area, uh, which is not what I meant to do, but I'm doing that anyway. <laughs> uh, so even when we do a, a future iteration, It'll be the same ISO standard, just updated. So I'm not saying we're going to iterate quickly. I'm just explaining what will happen. So for instance, let's say we're ISO number XYZ, and then colon 2020, that's when it came out. Uh, when there is an update to that standard, it'll be ISO XYZ colon, let's say, 2023. And this will make it very clear that it's the same standard, and it's the same process of iteration that we see in other standards, whether it's ISO 14001 or ISO 26262, that's quality and functional safety. Uh, you know, so we're going to fit very neatly into the ISO process. But yeah, communicate to people that what is there now, open chain two, and what will be there very shortly, the ISO standard, which we're calling 2.1, they're functionally identical. So anyone who's open chain conformant with open chain two or 2.1 will be ISO conformant. And these organizations can expect that conformance to be both valid and useful for years. Oh, here's an interesting one. This is Song Lee. How should the syntaxes, compilers, standards, uh, in the source code be expected to keep up while the industry is involved. Oh, evolving. Um, so I, I think I would separate very clearly here, um, code development and something like open chain, which is process. 
the process for open source compliance is not something that iterates quickly. The code going through the process might iterate quickly, but that has no impact on open chain. Uh, Mark, do you think that would be a, a good way to capture that? Yes, I think you did. You you nailed that one in terms of program versus you know a discipline. Yeah, and instead of yeah. tooling, it's different. You know, Open Chain is the first standard from Linux Foundation, the first formal standard, ISO standard, in 14 years. The last time we did one, it was Linux Standard Base, which described the base Linux system. And uh, Linux Standard Base had great utility in the early days for things like enterprise Linux adoption. But as Song Lee pointed out, code iterates pretty quickly. So Linux Standard Base set the baseline for Linux in areas like enterprise. But of course, Linux itself evolved relatively rapidly uh, past that. Um, and with something like that code, you could end up iterating the standard quite frequently. So you could end up iterating a code standard at a much more rapid pace than you'd iterate a process standard. But OpenChain is a process standard. Uh, the code that's going through the process, it doesn't matter. I mean, we say, for instance, know what your inbound code is. And you can do that automated, you can do it manually, it doesn't matter. So that means that as you iterate the technical process, you're not changing the compliance process. You're just enhancing those particular inflection points with the tools at hand. So our standard doesn't change with the code. Yeah. I, I think the other thing to highlight there is um, we, the, the, the standard describes a high level overview of a set of requirements, although your compliance program itself can evolve and still satisfy the obligations of, of the spec. So um, that doesn't mean your program will, will stay stagnant either. Um, for example, I've seen places where people are constantly looking at how we can automate compliance, right? That's a common uh, discussion. I see that in the tools group. And so you might still be building a bill of materials, which is a requirement of the, of the, um, of the, of the spec, but how you build that bill of materials gets more effect or more efficient, um, possibly through using new tools or new automation techniques. So I think you need to, you know, we always have to separate out the spec in a high level set of you know core requirements versus the ability for your program to evolve continuously. That's a really good point as well, because when it comes to something like uh, software bill of materials, if people are using a standard like SPDX, which incidentally will be the next standard by Linux Foundation, SPDX is a software bill of materials. Um, OpenChain is the first through JDF, SPDX will be the second. So you can expect them later this year or early next year. Uh, if you're using something like SPDX, that standard is designed to be human readable or machine readable. So you can automate it. Uh, you can automate it in multiple different ways. It just doesn't matter. The standard is still the standard. So that's to Mark's point. Uh, we have a question from Fabian about compliance rate of adoption in certain industries. Um, are some industries more compliant uh, because of, let's say, massive uh, companies in the field? Um, are people more quick to self-certify into some industry than are other industries in the dark? Uh, yeah, Fabian is asking, will there be a tidal wave in automotive for vias? Um, or do people already do this and it's just phrased differently? It's an interesting question. What do you think, Mark? Well, um, I definitely think there are certain kinds of industries that have embraced open source and also might have a slightly higher risk profile around yeah. the use of open source. Not that open source is more risky, it's just that they're out there more in volume. So for example, um, a lot of device vendors, the Internet of Things world, um, they are putting out devices and they're putting them out in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. And if they ever end up with a problem with open source, um, then that's going to be multiplied by the number of devices they have in the world. Um, so I do see, um, and by the way, I think those are the kinds of companies, the, especially the, the companies that do a lot of embedded software, were really got on um, early to this process. Um, and also with SPDX, 
I, th I felt that that were the drivers also behind SPDX. When you have a, an industry that has a slightly different risk profile, then yeah, I think you're going to see um, more um, reluctance to come on or not as, they won't be the early adopters. Um, as far as automotive, I'm not experienced with automotive industry. I have more experience with the aerospace and defense, but um, I think that my, my take on the automotive industry is that it seems like open source is starting to take off, especially in the last five years in terms of understanding it. And I've seen them you know, resourcing open source more than um, they have done it you know, any time in the past. And so I anticipate um, the automotive industry is becoming more and more savvy or, or, or understanding the, the value proposition around open source. Um, and as they uh, understand that the, the great um, benefit, I do think you're going to see more, but I think it'll probably be the tidal wave will come when clearly when they, the the automotive manufacturers are requiring their suppliers or their t top tier one suppliers require their top tier two suppliers. However, one thing I think they can do is not necessarily expect all the suppliers to move very quickly, but to incrementally um, put r rules around incrementally a um, adopting open chain within their supply chain. So for example, they can say to a supplier, all right, I know that you don't have it today, but tell me where you are. We'll accept that and show me your, you know, get well plan in the next two years to get to the compliance or conformance. And I think that's more likely to happen in the automotive industry. I mean, I guess the industries where we saw the most interest initially definitely embedded um, lower up, huge. Uh, we've, we've seen significant interest from companies optimizing their supply chain in places like cloud. But I would highlight automotive as an area where the interest has been exceptionally high. And in the next few months, um, there will be some announcements and development in automotive, which will very much underline this. So, I mean, if I was to pick industries that are super, super engaged with open chain, I'd say embedded, mobile, automotive. These are the people shipping product right now that need this harmonization as quickly as possible. And then I'd add on that cloud companies, uh, Microsoft, are very involved as well, uh, because of course, they're very aware that underpinnings of a lot of their industry is open source. But yeah, automotive is definitely engaged and can't talk about details, but there will be announcements regarding major automotive companies that will have a huge effect on the automotive supply chain. So it's definitely one to watch in that industry. Um, I'd also just highlight that there's no industry where people are like, yeah, we don't care. <laughs> um, there's no industry where that's the situation. It's just that the, the largest priorities are people in areas like embedded, mobile, automotive, getting those physical products to market. Uh, these people are distributing a lot of open source. Uh, we have a question from Kobotasan. He, he would like to confirm that OpenChain 2.0, 2.1 will match the ISO standard. Uh, answer is yes. OpenChain 2.0, our current standard, is functionally identical to what will be the ISO standard. OpenChain 2.1 is just OpenChain 2 formatted for ISO. So anyone who's open chain to conformant will be conformant with the ISO standard. And you can check that on our website using our online self-certification web app. It's free. And that will allow you to essentially become ISO conformant. So you can actually become conformant with open chain today. And as soon as we have the ISO number published, you'll know that you're conformant with that ISO number. That's one reason that a lot of companies uh, that are in our community that are open chain 2.0 conformant, they're a little bit ahead of the game because on day one that the ISO standard is out, they're ISO conformant. So yeah, Kubota uh, San, if someone adopts open chain 2.0 or 2.1, that is the ISO standard um, and they will be ISO conformant. Uh, the question about ISO certification, you can self-conform to an ISO standard. Uh, you can choose somebody to do an independent compliance assessment, or you can choose third-party certification. These are three options, um, and it's entirely dependent on your industry. So in areas like, let's say, mobile, most people are self-certified. 
in areas like automotive. At this juncture, most people are self-certifying, but a lot of people are interested in independent compliance assessment, having a third party check what's going on. And some entities are interested in full third party certification where an organization like TUVSUD or PWC actually certifies you. These are all options, uh, but yeah, you can certify, you can self certify to OpenChain today, OpenChain 2.0, and that will make you ISO uh, conformant. So it's a good time to do it. So. You know, being very explicit about this, Cisco announced OpenChain 2.0 conformance about two weeks ago. And as soon as the ISO standard is out, they're conforming with that ISO standard. So it's a, it's a nice market position. Anyone who adopts OpenChain in the next few months will essentially be in a great position for both marketing and practical deployment in September. Um, Mark, I think Wind River is the only company maybe that has self-certified to every version of the open chain standard, <laughs> if you recall correctly. Um, we are with all the other um, versions. Um, not sure who else is, but yeah, we definitely are. And it's actually been a, um, a big plus for, like as I discussed earlier, for the several different reasons that um, we see value in open chain. It's, uh, it is interesting how the open chain conformance is useful for companies uh, in sales negotiations. I mean, it's useful for procurement because you can make sure your suppliers are doing the right thing. But in sales negotiations, you can say, hey, look, we're, we're using an industry standard. Uh, this is clearly unambiguously how you do open source compliance. And uh, we, we have a, I don't know how many people I've even had there. people yeah, go for it. I'm sorry. I was just going to say that we've had um, dialogues with customers, and I've talked to them about how we're open chain conforming, kind of educated them a little bit, and they turned around and they put the, that terms in our contract that we will, you know, maintain open chain conformance. So that's pretty good. So I mean, my, um, yeah, yeah. So it's been very practical for you in the customer sense. Mm -hmm. And it makes the dialogue very simple and, and straightforward because um, a lot of times there's a lot of fuzziness sometimes around compliance. I can tell you when people will talk about like, all right, what are you going to give us in terms yeah. of the compliance artifacts, right? And they sometimes want to list those out in the contract. Um, and I can't have every single different customer come to me and say, well, I want it this way and another customer negotiates a different way and, and so forth. It's too costly and too complex. So um, we standardize on two things, open chain as a, you know, our program and also SPDX data delivery. Whenever they come to us and they want to say, hey, look, um, we want this um, compliance information. Well, we say we're going to give it to you in, in SPDX format and we're going to follow the open chain standard. And that saves a, a lot of cost for us when we're dealing with many different customers. I'm doing a super quick screen share here uh, just to show on the open chain website, and you should be able to see this on the screen share, there are conformance logos. So it shows which version of open chain you conform with. And if you're Wind River, you've got all of these logos in your literature. Uh, this is a really quick shortcut for people to know what their supplier company is up to. Or it's a really quick shortcut for a purchasing company to become conformant and set that expectation for their supply chain. So, you know, hypothetically, if an automotive maker says I'm open chain 2.0 conformant, the suppliers know that that's what this company wants and that's the uh, particular version we should work on. And I'll just see if I can uh, bring it up. There's an online certification, self-certification web app. Uh, I'm not sure if I can sign in. Oh, yeah, maybe I can. Nope, password does not work. So uh, this particular web app allows you to certify with the open chain standard. It's a series of yes, no questions uh, that you can utilize to check if the company has the right requirements. And if you answer a question with a no, you can very quickly uh, understand, oh, that's where I need to put resources on my open source compliance program. So we, we tried really hard to make sure that the basic material was in place for open source uh, compliance, 
via OpenChain to be very simple and easy to understand. And, uh, Mark, if I recall correctly, you had pretty deep involvement in setting this up as well. Um, yeah, we were one of the first ones to go forward with it. And I think that is also very helpful because it guides you through the, um, ensure that you're covering everything. And along the way, you're gathering up the data to satisfy the different questions. And, and, and then you're storing that data. And so what we are actually audited by our, our customer, um, we can easily pull out the data that we, you know, gathered up to satisfy each of the questions. And so it was very that, helpful um, even after, yeah. I mean, just to that point, the spec, the current spec is split into six parts. And here under part four, uh, the second yes, no question is, do you archive copies of the compliance artifacts of the supplied software? So yeah, you either archive a copy of that uh, compliance artifact, whatever is necessary for compliance, or you don't. Um, and if you don't, you now know that that's something you should do. And what's interesting here is that in OpenChain, the final questions essentially say, do you have the documentation confirming that your program meets these requirements? So do you have documentation showing how you did it? And do you have documentation confirming that the program was reviewed in the last 18 months to make sure that you know, something didn't end up dead? So in this sense, if you go through the spec, the first five sections are about answering questions about doing the right stuff. Do I have this? Do I do that? And then the last section is conform, confirming that you have a record of doing that stuff, uh, which is useful for you, but it's also useful for your, for your customers because they can say, um, let me see the record. Let me see if I'm happy with how you did this. Yeah. And then they can go back and say, I'm happy with everything you did except this process point, which I would like improved. And I think that allows OpenChain to be policed by economics. It allows your own supply chain to determine what's appropriate, uh, your customers to decide what's appropriate with the companies. That's how I describe it. Do you think that's yes, accurate, Mark? Yeah, and, and this is also, yes, I do. And I also found it very useful when we were acquiring a company recently and we were sitting down doing the due diligence and I'm always brought in to help out with the open source um, due diligence part of the, of the transaction. And I did, what I did was I took this list of questions and I, I, I walked through with the, with the target company and got them to answer it. I understood that they would not be open chain conforming, but I understood where the gaps were when I was done. And this was a great guide for that. That's so that when point. we did bring them on board, we knew how, where we can actually work, you know, fill in the gaps. And side note, uh, it also, if someone's got a lot of messes in what they're doing during an M&A discussion, no doubt you can push down the price still. <laughs> it's a win-win. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's actually surprising our online self-certification questionnaire all of it's private until you fill it all out and you choose to submit it for conformance. But you don't have to. You can just sign in, use the questionnaire, save your answers, um, and that's it. You can use it entirely privately. And we found out that 50% of the companies using this are using it for conformance activities. So they're thinking about we'll conform with the open chain standard. But 50% of companies using this are utilizing it for health checks and internal resource allocation. So in other words, they're finding out how is our compliance program looking and where do we need to invest? So those companies are not precluding, they're not saying we'll never conform, but they're utilizing this online resource to refine what they do, to save time, to save money. And personally, I think that's a sign of success. I mean, Mark, it means that not only are people are checking boxes to get a standard, they're, um, they're using what we have to be more effective in their company, to use less resources and to have less risk uh, in an easier way. De definitely. I, and I think what it does is, and this is a very um, important point, 
um, a lot of times I see companies come and they say, I don't know where to start, right? Um, we we want to do this compliance thing, but where do we start? And I right. think this it focuses everybody. It makes it a much more efficient task um, by following this checklist um, and giving clear guidance. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it does help with efficiency just on that aspect alone. And I suppose one final note is that every version of the Open Chain standard is a great starting point. So it's not a case of Open Chain 2 is miles better than Open Chain 1. It's just we have iterated, we've improved the translation of language and so on. So let's say hypothetically your customer company is Open Chain 1.1 conformant and you're a supplier and they say, well, I want you to be Open Chain 1.1 conformant. That's no problem. You just log into the web app, just choose your version, and you have the questions appropriate to that version of the standard. So we've made sure that this whole thing can work across multiple years of procurement, multiple different decisions by suppliers and customers. Uh, we've, we've built this as flexible as possible to solve the real world problem. We're out of time. So if anyone has one last question, you're welcome to type it in. Otherwise, we're gonna wrap it up here. Mark, I gotta say thank you for making time to walk through uh, where we are, we are at with the standard. Uh, if it's okay with you, I have a recording of your section with the slides, um, and I'd like to you know, include that if possible in a recording, but it depends on whether it's okay with you. Mm -hmm. I hope those yeah, slides yeah. are great. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, everyone. It's the slides I use with my customers. <laughs> They're awesome. Yep. They're really nice. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mark. Have a great day. Oh, you know, one last thing. Bye, everyone. Don't forget to join our community. <laughs> Openchainproject.org. Take care, all. <laughs>